I know that many of you have heard Michael Moorwood at Rotec conferences, and I know that many of you have used his books in your groups. Michael is a spiritual leader, he is a retreat giver, gives days of reflection workshops, and he's an author of a number of spiritual books. The latest one is It's Time, and I think a number of you, have some of you bought it already? Let's see, some of you? Good. I think there's still 16 more copies, so do your best. Michael encourages us to imagine way beyond the confines of prepared dogmas and definitions. He encourages us to see reality in a new way, in a way that makes sense to us in the 21st century. And I don't know whether any of you, like me, sometimes when we're asked to say, I do, I do, I do, when various things are read out, and you kind of say, I do, and you kind of half cross your fingers, you know? <laughs> because the language is not our language. And Michael opens us up to a new way of, of seeing things and a new way of perceiving our God. So I would ask you to welcome very warmly Michael Moore. I greatly appreciate the invitation to be with you, to speak with you. I want to talk about windows to the sacred, windows to the divine. At any time in history, humans use what is available to them as, as pointers to the divine mystery that we put this word God on windows to a mystery that is beyond us. And the windows are composed of many elements. It could be personal experience, it's the, the world around us. I had those windows growing up Catholic. I also had the key windows of scripture and church teaching and doctrine and Catholic education. They were my key windows to the divine. And Vatican II basically used those windows in shaping its documents. And what has happened in my lifetime in the last 50 years is that the, the windows to the mystery the divine creative mystery have changed so radically that I could never have imagined in the 1960s that I would be where I am today and that the windows that I have to the divine today are so utterly, utterly radically different from the windows that I had when I was ordained a priest in 1969. The key windows, just to mention a couple, the key windows to the divine today for me and, and for so many people, and I think these will be the windows to the divine for future generations, for the church of tomorrow, for the faith of tomorrow and beyond the church and the faith to the human story of tomorrow. The key windows for me, one has been the Hubble telescope that provides me with images of the universe that is so stupendous, so magnificent, so incredible in age and size 
I knew nothing about that in the 1960s. Nor did the writers of the documents of Vatican II. Oh yes, we knew that Earth was not the center of the universe. But now we know it's just a tiny, almost cosmic little blimp somewhere. And we're now in a concept of that everywhere is, it, it, it's mind-blowing. <coughs> totally and utterly mind-blowing. We even hear now that there may be universes beyond this universe. And we're dealing with literally billions of galaxies and each galaxy has billions of stars. And here we are in a galaxy situated around one star that we know, as we know, travel today will never move outside this one star. And we think we know what God is. <laughs> and we say God is everywhere. I learned that as a little Catholic boy. God is everywhere. What, what does it mean for me today to say that the mystery that I put this word God on, the divine, creative, energizing reality that holds everything in existence, to say that that is everywhere, when I look at the images from the Hubble telescope, I'm, I'm not in the imagination of the scripture writers. I'm not in the imagination of Paul. I'm not in the imagination of the people who shaped the Nicene Creed. I am in a totally and utterly different religious imagination. And Christian faith will either accept that or it will wither. It will be seen as a museum piece. Along with the Hubble telescope, when it tells me not only about the size of the universe, but about the age of this planet, then side by side with that, I, I, I look to the scientific world. And, and I try and read about quantum physics that I simply do not understand. But again, I'm, I'm immersed in a world that I, I knew absolutely nothing about when I was in high school. I knew absolutely nothing about this in the 1960s. And now, science tells me that everything in this universe, everything that seems material to us, is a form of energy. That there's no matter, but little vortices of energy. And that everything in the universe somehow is interconnected. And then when I look at this scientific story, the, sci the science tells me a story that embedded, embedded in reality, in the elements, in the atoms, in the molecules, in, in cellular development. In, embedded is, is like there are patterns of operation where units get together and, and, and in the togetherness create something beyond themselves. So science tells me this story about soon after the Big Bang and elements getting together to form hydrogen and hydrogen gets together and forms helium and, and off you go. And then we look at the history of this planet, four and a half billion years. We see the same patterns of operation in the evolutionary development of life on this pattern. We see it particularly in the cellular development, where single cells get together and form multi-cells. And so on, down to us. And here I stand tonight with 60 trillion cells in my body. 60 trillion! And one trillion will die tonight and be replaced. No wonder we wake up tired in the morning. <laughs> but 
60 trillion cells work for the good of, of this. It's like a community working together for the good of this body. And you know, this, not one cell is thinking about it. Not one of them. And so the scientific world is telling me this incredible story of togetherness, of patterns of operation. It tells me a story that energy is everywhere. It tells me a story that, that consciousness, not conscious awareness, but consciousness in the sense of mind <coughs> operating, is all through the universe. The cells in my body don't think about what they're doing. You know, I'm, I'm totally amazed when I think about, I can't imagine this, but, you know, when, when I was an embryo in my mother's womb, and some cells went off to form my ears, and other cells form my liver, and other cells form my eyes. And you know, they're not thinking about it. And the universe is permeated, permeated with this sort of action. Wouldn't we be in a mess if the cells had to think about what they're doing? <laughs> and what have we humans done? We've taken our human operation, our operating model of you know, conscious awareness, and we get information, we process it, and we put it on this divine being we call God. We have a God who thinks. We have a God who thinks about it. We have a God who has opinions. You know, where the women should be ordained priests. <laughs> I mean, really. What is, what is the concept of, of God or of, 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 of the divine that will shape faith in the future? It will not be, I don't think anyway, it will not be in terms of a God. It won't be. It's gone. It's over. It's finished. Future generations will not think about a God. Not unless you can take that word G-O-D and, and, and bring it to a contemporary understanding of the size of the universe and patterns of operation all through the universe and then talk about the divine presence. That this is what we mean by when I use this word God. I'm not talking about a God who lives in heaven anymore. I'm talking about a reality that I was taught to respect growing up Catholic, that I was taught to respect in a Catholic seminary. That by this word God, I'm pointing to a mystery that is totally and utterly beyond my human comprehension. I'm being led to respect when I look at the windows, when I contemplate the windows, I'm, I'm being led to respect, to honour the fact that this mystery I call God is, is not a, a localised deity somewhere anymore. And what do I find? I find I can go into my Christian tradition. I can quote Gregory of Nyssa in the 4th century. He said, when we contemplate the universe, or when one considers the universe, can we be so simple-minded as not to believe that the divine is present in everything, pervading, embracing, and penetrating everything that exists? I, I can go, I can read a book like Saving Paradise and see that for the first hundreds of years in Christian art, that Christian art depicted the divine here with us, not somewhere else. I can go to the voice of the mystics in our tradition who speak the language of connectedness and mystery and wonder. I find it interesting that the same century that Gregory of Nyssa made that statement, we had the, the Council of Nicaea trying to decide who Jesus had to be in order to get us to where God lived. We have a theology of disconnectedness. 
we have a story that we've gathered around in faith. That's the story that we've literalized this story of a God who's somehow disconnected from us. I don't think that's going to be the story of the future. I don't think it's going to be the universal story for humanity. So I, I want, I, I want personally, I want my church and I want humanity. I want humanity to immerse itself in a story, a scientific story first of all, that talks about the wonder of what it is to be human. That the universe, through processes of working together and cooperation, that the universe produces this life form. I mean, oh, wow, I mean, what is it to be human? And then Christian faith, I bring my Christian faith to this scientific story, and my Christian faith tells me, and Michael, you know, it's not just the story of the universe, it's the story of the divine, creative, energizing presence at work in the universe that expresses itself in this life form. What is it to be human? A poor, banished child of Eve, mourning and weeping in a valley of tears? <laughs> You know that the next life is the more important life. This is a preparation for you know when we get to where God really is. To be human, to be human is to give the creative, energizing mystery a way of coming to expression. So I want to immerse myself. I want I want future faith. I want my church to embrace the window. That's here today for us. And then if we immerse ourselves in this window, let me very briefly, in the five, six minutes I've got left, let me very briefly take this window. See, this is my starting point today. I'm not starting with Scripture anymore. I'm not starting with the Nicene Creed. I'm not starting with what the Pope says. I'm starting with this window. This utterly incredible, wonderful story of the divine at work in the universe, of what it is to be human, and now immersed in this story, now let me go back, and now, if it's true today, it was true 5,000 years ago. It was true 20,000 years ago. But the Aboriginal people who walked this country for 40,000 years gave human expression to the, to the divine. And the story of the human is the story of a, of a species with conscious awareness struggling throughout its history to understand this mystery working in whatever windows it had. <coughs> so I go back to the roots of our religion, to Judaism. I go back, I go back before Judaism and I, I think that, you know, if the divine is at work in the human species, and if the divine, you know, working through what I know from science, if the divine works through patterns of cooperation and working together to develop something beyond the present, then I would expect to find, like embedded, embedded in the human, as it is in all the creation, I would expect to find a voice coming from within the human, from, from, from the ground up, if you like, giving human expression to this reality. And I would expect to find this voice saying, stop the violence, work together, cooperate, love one another, be neighbor. And what strikes me today is, this is not a voice coming from the heavens. This is a voice, this is a presence that's embedded in the human. Because the human is giving expression to the divine. And so then I look at Judaism. And sure, if I look at the prophets, they were caught into the notion that, yes, you know, the Lord God spoke to me and this is what the Lord God wants. And what do I find in Judaism? I find that Judaism is not 
at all concerned about the next life. It's not concerned with a God who locked us out. I find that Judaism is concerned with this life. That we are called to build a society of peace and justice and compassion that we will be like a light to the nations and people will come to see what it's like when the human gives proper expression to the divine in their midst. And of course, as I said, of course they thought it was like, well, God spoke to me. When I read the prophets, the Lord God said to me, that's the way they thought of it. Now I don't think of it that way anymore. Now I think the Lord God spoke to me, but it's coming from within. And what does this voice within us want? It wants us to live passionately, compassionately. It wants us to stop the violence. We do not need an external God to tell us that. It's embedded in us. And now when I go to the story of Jesus, Jesus comes out of his Jewish history. Jesus is the human expression of the divine. And Jesus at Nazareth looks around him and he sees people don't get this. They don't believe it. That's not what they've been taught. Religion has told them a different story. And who rules the world? Well, the Romans rule the world. Political power, domination, <coughs> political military might. And how are we going to change that? Well, here's the story then of Jesus of Nazareth. Are we going to tell the story of Jesus of Nazareth in the future that it's basically a story about a God who locked us out of heaven and, and Jesus says, well, you know, I'm going to die and because God is withholding, withholding forgiveness and presence to a God who lives somewhere else. Is that going to be the story that we're going to keep on telling? Or will we go into the gospel through this lens of what we have today and, and see a story that's there? That Jesus is primarily about changing this world. He wants people to create the kingdom of God here. I don't think Jesus was in any way concerned about the next life. That comes later, came after he died, begins with Paul. Paul, Jesus is about a way. So I go, I go back to the gospel through this lens. I'm trying to look at, you know, the, the window to the divine today. It's at work in everyone. And I see Jesus looking at people and they don't see what he sees. They don't experience what he experiences. So the task of Jesus is, how do I change the people to see what I see, to experience what I experience, to believe what I believe about the human? Because if they believe that, if they convert, and believe a different story about themselves, then they can change the face of the earth. But God's not going to do it. Well, I'm not going to do it, says Jesus. And basically, he says to the crowd, you're going to do it. But the crowd, the populace, is not going to do it if they're embedded in a story that says, oh, poor me, God cannot be near me, or God, I'm to be fearful of God. So for me, the church of tomorrow, the Christian church of tomorrow, has to, I believe, has to engage the contemporary window to the sacred and use that window to go back to the story of Jesus and not tell that story in terms of a God out there who locked us out of heaven, but immerse itself in the, in, in the, the preaching of Jesus about the kingdom. But Jesus' primarily ta primary task was to convert people to see and experience what he saw and experienced so that they could change the world. Nothing is more important than this, says Jesus. Nothing. Don't turn back. This is the pearl of great price because Jesus is saying, if you don't do it, then the Romans win. If you don't win, the greedy and the powerful will keep oppressing you. So Jesus primarily is trying to affirm people in a presence. Believe the good news. I mean, what's the story we're going to tell this coming week in Easter? 
Is it going to be primarily about a man dying on a cross to change a God's mind out there? Or will it be the story of the divine coming to such clear expression in a human person and that he saw the urgency of this for the future of humanity and nothing was more important than this for him and he was ready to die for it and you and I we put up our hands and say Jesus I'm with you in this Thomas Berry often said for the first time in human history for the first time in human history we have a common story about our origins we have a common story human story about who we are as humans the scientific story is just an absolute wonderful memorizing incredible story that the universe in transformation after transformation produces this life form that we are and we bring our faith to this story and we look around and say we give human expression to the mystery of God that is our human faith this is the window I think the church of tomorrow has to embrace but in doing it in doing it, it faces great opposition. I, I never expected to write another book. And why did I write It's Time? On about the third or fourth page, you'll find I mention Bishop Bill Morris. I was so annoyed. <laughs> I mean, I really was. And I was living in America. And I know many, many, many American Catholics were so annoyed too. How could a church possibly do this to a man of faith, a man of great pastoral ministry? How could it do that? I did it because of Ray Bourgeois being removed by priesthood. And I did it, I think, most of all because I was watching what was happening to the religious sisters in the United States. Yes. Yes. And I was seeing that doctrine, doctrine is being used as a weapon of control. Yes. And that the question for the CDF, for the religious women in the United States, was a yes-no proposition. Do you believe the doctrine of the church? Yes, no. Well, hang on, we have different windows to the... Yes, no. Oh, well, hang on, we want to talk... Yes, no. We've got to stop this. We've got to stop this. I think so much of our doctrine today is it, it, it's, not, it's not open. It's not honest. I think so much of doctrine today embedded in our history yes it came out of a window to the sacred but that window's gone. I don't believe in a God in the heavens who locked us out. I don't believe that. I don't believe Jesus primarily was about getting us into heaven. I don't believe that anymore. We get into all sorts of doctrinal issues then. But we've got to talk about it. But I think what happens, I'll finish with this very quickly, I think what's happened is that I think so much of what we call doctrine today is institutional theology. It's theology for the sake of the institution. Yes. Why does the church as an institution hang on to so much of doctrine? You know, the idea that there's a God out there, you know, a personal deity who's got thoughts about whether women should be ordained and thinks about this, even God's plan of salvation and, and, and all this. Why does it hang on to that? Because when you hang on to that institutionally, one, you can claim institutionally we have access to that God and you don't. Secondly, we can tell you what this God thinks about all sorts of issues. <laughs> and third, that we can play the role of middle management between you, a people dependent on us to tell you what God thinks, or even in Eucharist, to bring the sacred to you. No, there's a better way than this. 
And the better way is the way of Jesus of Nazareth. Mm. You live in love, you live in God. Mm. The divine creative presence is here. We need to shape prayer and liturgy and priesthood and, and faith around this. And the last thing that we want to do is creedalize today's worldview. Because I know, I certainly believe, that in ten years' time, the windows are going to change again. But the fascinating thing is, the fascinating thing is, one, the windows get more amazing and wonderful, and two, that the message of Jesus of Nazareth stays centre. Mm -hmm. Stays centre and stays good news for us. That's what I want to see in the Church of Tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Breath of Creator, essence of star.